Um, can I have a redo, everybody? We're having some technical issues because um, the school library journal account is like, hey, we're having a weird login from some crazy lady in Seattle and this is not right. So I think we have figured it out. I think that we are good to go now. I'm gonna be here, stay here. Hopefully Instagram's not gonna kick me out anymore and um, I can actually officially begin my spiel. So I wanna redo, can I have a redo? I wanna say my first thing that I was gonna say, which is thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here to come watch me. Um, thank you for uh, supporting my books and for supporting me as an author illustrator. Thank you School Library Journal for letting me uh, invade your Instagram live account and I'm seeing all of the comments coming up and this is great, yay! All right, okay, serious me. Now, we're gonna do some awesome stuff. We're gonna talk about art and science and books and misconceptions and I'm gonna be answering all of your questions as well. And I see you guys all coming up. This is amazing. It's like multi-sensory and uh, I don't know if I can handle it, but I'm gonna try and I'm waving back. I'm not gonna push wave every single time, just so you know. Okay, so we're restarting. First off, a little about me. I'm Ellie Peterson. I am the author illustrator of these books that I threw on the floor when I was mad. Here they are, I got them, okay. <laughs> They're gonna show up backwards for you, I'm sorry. It's a mirror image. It says, it's a round, round world. And this one, The Reason for the Seasons. This is one of the Julia Copernicus books as well, the second one that just came out in February. And um, these books are about this spunky little girl scientist, she, she might have a few things in common with me, uh, who sets out to address the world's misconceptions in science about really important scientific phenomena. Uh, I'm not just an author illustrator, I'm also a science teacher and I've been a science teacher for 17 years. I know, it's a crazy long time, 17 years. So I am somebody who is into art and I'm into science and that maybe that seems weird to some people but it seems like it totally makes sense to me because art and science have one really important commonality. They both require the power of observation. Okay, so let's say I'm a scientist who wants to study this really bizarre little plant. Um, this is a cactus. I've named him warts, even though it says it backwards to you. That says warts, okay? So I'm a scientist, right? I'm gonna make some observations about this cactus. And observations means that you're looking at something really closely, right? So I'm gonna look at it, I'm gonna think about beautiful and hideous at the same time. It's got like little bumps, little warts all over it. I'm thinking about the texture of it. I'm thinking about the color of it and how the color changes. You know, um, this is not a pokey cactus, so maybe I'll, I'll see how it feels. Oh, not pokey, it kind of feels nice actually. I might smell it. Mm. I might uh, find out what it sounds like. Uh, yes, sounds Sounds like a cactus, okay? Um, I'm not gonna taste it because we shouldn't just taste random plants. Some plants are dangerous, so definitely don't do that. So this is what I'm doing as a scientist to learn about this thing, okay? Now, let me put on my artist hat, okay? Uh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do the same thing, guys. I'm going to make observations about it. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to think about the texture. I'm going to think about the color. I might think about what it feels like. Okay. And at the same time that I'm thinking about this, I'm going to be learning a lot about it as well. So these are two huge things that art and science have in common. And if you, maybe there's some kids out there and you have some drawing materials, maybe you can get a paper or a pencil or a marker or something like that. Let's, let's look at this cactus like scientists and let's look at it like artists. If I set it down here, will you be, no, I can't see. Okay, I'll just keep holding it with my left hand like this and draw with my right hand. So I'm gonna think about this little cactus here. 
I see one kind of central blade here that um, goes from the bottom and hooks like an upside down J. And then I see all of these little projections that are coming off of the sides. The ones at the bottom are longer. So those have grown more. Maybe they're a little bit older. And the ones at the top near um, the end of it here are shorter. Okay, so these are th good things for me to know. Uh, I'm going to note that all of these little projections have little uh, tufts on them, little teeny tiny tufts. They're kind of fuzzy. All right, so I'm going to draw this. You want to draw it too? Of course you do. Go start drawing it, okay? I'm going to start drawing mine right now. Warts, here we go. We're going to draw you. All right, you're going to be famous. Uh, I do name all of my plants. I think it's good for them. I think they like it. Plus, when I'm in my studio and they're here on my windowsill, um, then I, I feel like I have some buddies <laughs> that are hanging out with me. All right, okay, so I'm gonna make these like weird little projections at the end. You can't see what I'm doing yet, but I'm gonna show you soon, so don't, don't worry. You should be making your own drawings as well. Kids, adults, you can do this too, guys. There's no reason. I know there's a lot of adults out there who are who are watching this and thinking, should I draw that cactus with her? See, it's really kind of like it would be fun. It is. I'm having a blast right now. Okay, so let's see here. Oh yeah, some good warts. I'm having I'm having a good time here. Let's see. Yeah, okay. This is looking good. I'm nearly there. I don't know about you guys. I'm gonna start adding my little tufts now. I'm getting crazy. Hi, everybody. I want to wave at you, but I'm holding a cactus with my left hand and drawing with my right hand, so I just, I cannot do it, okay? And I'm going to, you know, sometimes um, as artists, we have to figure out some ways to kind of represent what we see without exactly drawing what we see, and that's a way for us to, uh, you know, put our creative bend on something. So I'm going to, like, kind of just make some little hash marks or X's for all of the little, you know, like on those things, you see the little, like the little tufts on every single one of these things. I can't do all of that by hand right now. School library journal is not going to give me that much time. Oh my gosh. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Almost done. Oh yes. Oh, you guys, are you ready? Here it is. Ta-da! Yes. Yes, there it is, warts. And you know, I always like to add a little face and I notice, maybe you've noticed this too. When I make the face, I make the eyes and the mouth really close together and really low down on it. And for some reason, it like automatically makes it cuter. I'll show you. Ta-da, see the face? Automatically a cute cactus. There we go. Yes, I hope you made one that looked almost as good as that. Better, probably better. Okay, well, talking about observations. Sometimes people ask me, hey Ellie, uh, where do you get the ideas for your books? Is that a question you're thinking about asking? I, th I hope you're thinking about asking some questions because I'm gonna answer some questions later on in this. And actually, you know what, I was supposed to pin comment in here. I'm going to do that. Oh, yes. Thank you people who have put in the Boyd's Mills Canes info. I will put in my Instagram info as well. Okay. But still, let's talk about where my book ideas come from. Okay. They mostly come from observing my students and my kids. Hi, Carter. Hi, Charlotte. If you're out there watching mom right now, so what am I looking for? What am I observing? I'm looking to see what questions they have and what sorts of things are challenging for them, okay? And one of those challenges that I noticed was understanding what causes the seasons. So I decided I'm gonna make a book about that. And I thought, you know, the first thing that I need to do when I make a book about this is address the misunderstandings that kids and adults, yes, adults you too, have about what causes the seasons. And those misunderstandings, we call them misconceptions. Okay, you have a concept, you have a picture in your mind about how something works, but if it's incorrect, we call it a misconception. 
Okay, so one of the, um, the biggest misconceptions out there about the seasons is that it is caused by Earth's distance from the sun. Let me actually show you a picture of what most people think. Okay, I gotta find it in my book here. I was gonna preload these to Instagram and then I thought I didn't need to and clearly I do. Again, text is gonna be backwards. Sorry, put on your mirror vision glasses if you can. All right, so you see that? Oh, how about there? Yes, that's good. Okay, so a lot of us know that the path of the Earth around the sun is an ellipse. You know, it's kind of not this perfect circle, maybe a little oval shape, and we hear that Earth is closer to the sun sometimes and further from the sun other times, right? And we think, oh, when it's closer, well, that's gotta be summer. And when it's farther away, that's gotta be winter. That's what causes it, right? Sure, makes sense. When you're closer to a source of heat, you feel warmer. When you're farther away, you feel colder. Makes perfect sense. But we need to think about what that actually means. Okay, so let's model it. And this is something that you could do at home too. Maybe you don't have a globe like I do. I actually have a lot of globes. This is the one globe that I have. I got another globe. I'll show you my other globe in just a second. I have another globe. I got this globe also. So maybe you don't have um, a globe, but you could still use like a soccer ball or a basketball or something like that too, okay? And what I want you to do is think about the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, all right? The Northern Hemisphere is this area north of this imaginary line in the middle of the globe that's called the equator. And the Southern Hemisphere is this area south of this imaginary line that's called the equator. Okay, so let's think about this idea about if Earth is closer to the sun, it's summer, it's further away, it's winter. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little person up here and a little person down here. So I'm gonna use in the Northern Hemisphere, um, it's gonna be Minecraft Villager Dude, okay? It's gonna be living here in the Northern Hemisphere. Stay, stay Minecraft Dude. And then in the Southern Hemisphere, I'm gonna use a little Shopkin watering can person, okay? In the Southern Hemisphere. So actually I got, Minecraft guy is uh, in Japan and um, little Shopkin person is down here in Australia, okay? So Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, there they are aligned. Okay, I'm gonna turn on my sun. I don't usually turn on a sun, but I'm gonna turn on my sun. There you go, did that work? Okay, and we're gonna think about this. Okay, so we're saying that in summertime, the earth is closer to the sun. So they're feeling warmer, they're closer to the brightness. So now they're having summer and further away, now they're having winter. Does that work? Seems like it would, but here's the deal. What we find is that when people in the Northern Hemisphere are having winter, the people in the Southern Hemisphere, they're having summer. Yeah, it's true. If you look up like pictures of people celebrating New Year's Eve around the world, you'll see like people in New York Times Square and they're wearing hats and mittens and scarves. They look like they're freezing. I'm here in Seattle. It's cold at New Year's Eve. It's not necessarily snowing, but it's cold. And then look for people celebrating like in Sydney, Australia. They're in flip flops, they're in sunglasses, they have sun umbrellas. Same day, totally opposite seasons. So it can't be the distance of the earth from the sun that's causing the seasons. Not only that, but here's the thing. You know that ellipse that we talked about that goes the, the path of the earth around the sun and it seems like it's this big oval and it's really close sometimes and really far other times, it's actually not that big a difference. And not only that, when the earth is closer to the sun, for us that actually happens in January, the winter month, and when it's further away from the sun, that actually happens in June, uh, for us a summer month. 
So that's clearly not the cause of the seasons. I have a page about that in my book too. I'll show you guys really quick. This one right here. I love this one. If you get the book, you can see this in more detail here. You can see um, Julia's up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, she's in New York. And then she's got her grandma is on vacation in the Southern Hemisphere. And you can see that Julia is experiencing winter and grandma's hanging out in her bikini by the pool. Go grandma. She's awesome. Okay. All right, well, what does cause the seasons? I'm not gonna tell you. You gotta get the book, guys. Get the book, yeah. And then you'll find out. I'll also address some other misconceptions that kids have. And adults, adults, it's okay if you have these misconceptions too. A lot of adults do. About what causes the seasons. Okay, what I would love to do right now with my remaining time, given this slightly later start, apologies for that, is to um, answer your questions for me about science, about art, about being an author, being an illustrator, is, am I naturally a blonde? You know, whatever you feel like asking, go for it. I'm gonna check my comments. Um, while I'm checking my comments here, I'm also going to put in my Instagram and Twitter handles, just in case those didn't make it in there. And you can find also my publisher, Boyd's Mills Kane. Uh, look in there and you will see they have their um, uh, handles as well. So here's me, I'm IG, IG, Instagram. I'm gonna wait for you guys. You guys put your questions in there for me. I'm waiting, have some good ones at, uh, Ellie underscore Pete. Okay, there's that one. And then for Twitter, for when I feel like tweeting, Twitter? No, Twitter. Twitter is at, it's just at Ellie Peterson altogether. Ellie Peterson. There you go, post. Um, if you're looking for me on Facebook, look for the Julia Copernicus books. It's not actually under my name. Look for Julia Copernicus books. I'm gonna turn the sun off. It's a little bright and actually it is getting a little warm in here. Okay, so um, I'm gonna look at some questions that I have here. Go into this and, oh, wow, that's a lot of you out there. Holy smoke. Okay, um, oh. Uh, Princess Plum Cake says, are there some characters more fun to draw than others? Yes. Um, I always find kids really fun to draw. Uh, and certain kinds of animals are fun to draw. Animals like, um, where you don't have to draw a lot of individual hair. I don't like drawing a lot of hair. Um, I do have a book I've been working on about a puffer fish. And drawing a puffer fish and pretty much anything that lives under the sea has been a blast. Except... Um, lobsters. Lobsters are not my favorite because they have the exoskeletons, they have a lot of plates that make up their body. And because I'm also the science person, I want everything to be anatomically correct. And I'm like, oh, wait a second, no, the, the, the chili pad here has to connect this way. And people, um, other part of me is like, it's a cartoon. Relax. It's okay if it's not perfect. So yeah, definitely there are some that are fun uh, compared to others. Looking for some more questions. Um, oh man, hi everybody. Oh, thank you, I am also impressed that I can draw with one hand. I actually do better when I hold the page down with my other hand. Um, people like the name Warts from my plant. I'm happy to see that. Um, yeah, some other names I have for my plants are Kevin. Um, I got a Steve in here. Um, hi to my kids who say hi back. That is one big globe, yeah. And um, sometimes I feel like deflating it, but then I remember how long it takes to reinflate it. So it just kind of stays inflated in my studio here all the time. Yeah, it's kind of annoying because my kids like to um, play with it and it drives me crazy a little bit but it would drive me more crazy to reinflate it every single time I wanted to use it. And I use it often. I do, I really do. Um, I mean, sometimes you just wanna know like the direction of the currents um, off the coast of Brazil. And I mean, I could just you know look at that and figure it out. Okay, um, I'm looking for your questions. 
I'm going down. Yeah, uh, bikini grandma. Uh, is there anything you can't do? I cannot do a cartwheel, guys. I, I've tried so many times, and when I do it, I, it looks like I'm doing this like this little weird baby somersault. Um, I'm, I, I'm just scared to really give it a go. I would like to learn how to do a cartwheel because I do martial arts and we're doing floor technique. If you can do a cartwheel, it takes up a lot more floor space and looks really impressive. Um, but I'm just um, I'm terrible at it. Uh, so I'm going to keep on working on that. If you have some tips on doing cartwheels, please put that in the comments for me. I could really use them. Okay. Um, how did I first get published? Well, kind of not in the typical way, actually. The first book that I illustrated is Bees Bees by um, the lovely Catherine Pryor. Uh, was published by Schiffer Books. And that was kind of interesting because Schiffer actually asks the author to give a lot of input as to who the illustrator is. So Catherine and I met. Um, I showed her some work. She loved it. She sent it to Schiffer along with some other uh, illustrators and then Schiffer selected me. And so um, one of the most awesome things about that is that she and I got to work really closely on that project and have become really good friends and um, chat all the time and we'll hopefully work on some future projects together as well. So it was not really um, maybe the traditional route. Now, for the Julia Copernicus books, I started out with It's a Round, Round World. And, oh, I might have the dummy just a second. Oh, let's see if I can find the dummy while I'm talking to you. Um, I started with that one and sent that out to a bunch of agents and editors who, um, here it is, guys. That's my original dummy. I know it's backwards for you. Again, that's super annoying. Instagram, please, let's work on that. Uh, but you can see like, you know, here's some of the, the pictures and they, they look very similar to um, what ended up being in the book. Isn't that fun? It's so fun to see these pictures um, after the book's been published. Anyway, so I, I sent this out to, I don't know, like 35 to 40 different agents and um, editors who were open to submissions. And I got um, two publishers interested right off the bat and found my amazing agent, Adria. She's out there watching. Hi, Adria. Um, uh, who uh, kind of sealed that deal for me. And it's been uh, wonderful working with Boyd's Mills, I have to say. My editor, Joy, she's the bomb. Amazing. Okay, so moving on. My favorite medium. So now I am actually working a lot digitally. Um, and so I use Procreate on my iPad for a lot of the artwork that I do. It's kind of interesting. I was telling some people, you know, I, um, I'm with all of us stuck at home, we're doing like everything digitally, right? We're doing so much stuff digitally. I feel like I'm looking at a screen constantly. And for a while there, I just had a hard time making new art. And I realized I needed to start using something that was digital to get my wheels turning. And so I pulled out some watercolors and colored pencils. I've been using temper paints with my kids and um, it's just gotten me, you know, flexed and ready to, to start working again. And so I feel like I can even work digitally uh, again as well, but I do love um, Procreate. Any tips for working on your art and lit with your kids at home, homeschooling? home learning. We call it mom school at my house and it's become a, a bad word, really. Um, man, it's not easy. I'm telling you, I mad props to all of you parents out there who are trying to work and have your kids at home trying to do their school stuff. Um, you know, I'm I want your tips. I, I'm I'm struggling. It's hard. Uh, one thing I do, I wake up earlier uh, than the kids. I try to get a lot done in the morning. I try to give them like their list of what they need to accomplish. Um, and then uh, it means also I kind of have to work off my normal schedule. So I'm kind of working early in the morning and later in the evening. Um, but also I'm trying to do creative things with them as well. If you guys check out my Instagram, a little while ago we did a... Um, stop motion animation of a revised tale of Little Red Riding Hood. 
which was super duper fun for me artistically and for the kids too. And they got to learn how to use, you know, stop motion um, animation, which was awesome. Another question, did I like to draw when I was a kid? I loved to draw when I was a kid. I drew all the time and I drew a lot of, you know, I copied a lot of things. So if you're a kid out there and you're like tracing stuff, like your favorite characters, um, that's great. You know, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You have to emulate before you can learn to do what it is that you want to do. So I drew a lot of Garfield, a lot of Garfield, um, Rainbow Bright, you know, I drew a lot of Rainbow Bright and Strawberry Shortcake, uh, and just kept doing that and drawing and drawing and drawing. And oh my gosh, guys, stay there. I have to show you something. Just wait a second. I found when I was in high school, I made comic books. You know that? The starring me and my girlfriends. It's my girlfriends, Nevin and Karin, you know? And I even made like a Christmas adventure comic book. So yeah, I've loved to draw always. And my one piece of advice for kids, draw all the time. Just draw, draw all the time. And it's okay if you're tracing or copying right now. When I was a kid, did I think I'd grow up to be a writer or artist or science educator or all of the above? I really wanted to be a teacher. Um, I had wonderful teachers growing up uh, and had so much respect for them. And um, I just thought that would be super fun. When I got into high school, I started working with younger kids, um, you know, going to into schools to volunteer. And I loved that. Um, I also was always really interested in life science. I lived near the woods and so I was going out in the woods all the time. I was like the dirtiest kid ever. <laughs> you know, I was catching snakes and frogs and digging up worms and stuff like that. So it kind of, you know, yeah. I mean, I don't think I said as a kid, like, I'm going to be a science teacher and an author illustrator, but definitely the interests that I had were leading me right in that direction. So, um, my favorite part of the drawing process is probably um, sketching, coming up with concepts, refining, ugh, so much work, adding color, not my favorite. <laughs> Once I have made up my mind about what the colors will be, then yeah, that's, that's great, but um, I struggle with color and my favorite part is really just coming up with the ideas and, and sketching. I love doing like um, character face lineups. So I'll come up with a character and I'll try to draw that character having like 20 different emotions. That is, that is always fun. Would I ever write stories for older kids? I would love to. I love middle grade novels. I, I read middle grade probably more than any other, you know, kind of group or genre or whatever of, of book. Um, I have to work on it though. I need to take some classes or something like that. Cause I don't, I don't know how to draft a novel. I have some novelists in my critique group and, um, frankly, it looks like torture. <laughs> so that makes me a little hesitant to actually, uh, go that route, but I would love to. I would love to. Um, how do other illustrators influence you? I love Marla Frazee's work. Love, love, love Marla Frazee's work. I got to meet her in person last summer at the SCBWI um, LA conference. And I was totally fangirling. I was like, oh, Miss Frazee, I, I love your work. You're my favorite illustrator. Da, da, da. Can I take a picture with you? I feel like such a dork, but I got that picture. And... I treasure it. Um, how she's influenced my work though is she's got this soft style. And I remember back when I was kind of earlier when I was starting, um, I was, you know, my watercolor wasn't very good and I was using like this hard pen and I got a suggestion to try a softer style and to look at, you know, really look at illustrators whose work I loved. And I started looking at Marla Frazee's work and she uses this soft black Prismacolor pencil for so much that she does. And now I just, I love the black Prismacolor pencils. I mean, I love them so much. Like here's my, this is my jar. <laughs> These are like the nubs that I just can't use anymore, but I can't stop 
you know, I can't throw them away. And I found out there's such a thing as a colored pencil extender. So I'm going to get one of those. Thank you to the person who suggested that a little while ago, um, because I, I need, I need them clearly. Uh, okay. So, um, do I find my characters or do they find you? Oh my gosh, that is so deep. Dang. Both. Um, some, sometimes they just, um, pop in my head and I'll, sometimes they'll just be from experiences I've had somewhere in my life, like the puffer fish when I was a kid. Um, we went fishing a lot out in, um, I think it's called Jamaica Bay in New York. And, uh, we caught a puffer fish one time <laughs> and my brother and I, oh my gosh, we probably tortured this poor puffer fish. We were like scratching its belly and then it'll puff up. It just stuck with me forever. You know, I remember catching little octopi and I love to draw, um, octopuses, octopi. I don't know. I love to draw them. And, um, so, you know, those ones kind of found me again later in life. Other times there's, there's something that I want to draw, you know, like I'll just kind of watch kids and be like, I just want to draw a little like round belly boy, like that little boy, you know, and I, that there's a story there. Um, so it goes both ways. Um, see if there's any other questions. I think I got to everything. I'm going to roll back here make sure that I didn't miss anything. Um, really life changing here. Thank you everybody for your questions or for tuning in. Apologies for all of the technical issues in the beginning, but we got it worked out and I'm here and I did it and whew, I'm like, I'm hot. This was a workout. My golly. Um, I think I got to all the questions, but if there is for some reason, something that you would love to ask me that I did not get to address, please, um, you can go back into the comments, find me on Instagram, find me on Twitter. If you do the Facebook thing, look for the Julia Copernicus books. And I think, I think I'm going to call it there. I think that's, that, that might be good. People are telling me thanks and great jobs. So I feel good. I feel like I can stop. <laughs> Thank you everybody for tuning in. And, um, I, I wish you all the very best with, you know, all that's going on and, and staying home. And I, I hope that you are finding those, those moments of, um, laughter and love and closeness that times like this can bring. Thank you for your support. Again, my books, it's Round Round World, Reason for the Seasons. I'm Ellie Peterson. Um, this was School Library Journal's author talk. Thank you so much. Mwah! Ha, ha, ha.